Hello, welcome once again. I'm Imran Garda. You're in the stream. Today, as more online activists are detained, is blogging worth the risk? A story that you, our community, voted up on our stream leads page. Our digital producer, Ahmed Shihabuddin, is here looking out for all your live feedback. Hey, Ahmed. Hey, Imran. Joining him on the couch is Rami Nakhle, an exiled Syrian blogger and cyber activist. We just called you a blogger, a cyber activist. You call yourself a citizen journalist. What's the difference and why, why are you a citizen journalist and not any of those other terms? Exactly. Actually, we don't have to make it controversial, really, and that's how it is now. I would call myself blogger, journalist, a citizen journalist. I, I would like to call myself a citizen journalist. Now there is a mean theory like in the world about the social media, they calling it as alternative media. I would not say this. I rather to say, no, we are not competing. We are completing each other, the new media and the, the mainstream media. Uh, <coughs> Actually, we have uh, we well, during the Syrian uprising. While I were working, we have a great example of this: how we completed each other. Mm -hmm. For example, we have the contacts in the ground. We were communicating with all of our friends of citizen journalists who been uh, operating in the ground. And in my heading house, actually in uh, in Beirut, I were having the correspondent of Al Jazeera English, and we were working together, really completing mm -hmm. each other to make the news to make the news and spread it for all over the world. It does, in a way, make you an activist and a dissident because the Syrian um, authorities have hounded you and have forced you to leave. So even if you were just a citizen journalist and somebody uh, without an agenda, just wanting yeah. to report on the news, the, the mere fact that you were cracked down upon makes you an activist and a dissident. Do you accept that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like all the dictatorship all over the world, the main thing they were trying to control all over the history is the flowing of information. They do not want to the population to know what they are really doing, how much, how much they are violating human rights, violating the rules, violating our rights. So now the, uh, they, were, they were managing really to control and censorship the mainstream media. But now with this big challenge for them, today every citizen is turning to be a journalist, how they would control this. That's why they start to crack down on every single blogger who publishing anything related mm. to politics or violation he's trying to document or report the abuses that this regime is doing. That's what happened with me. That's what's happening every day with thousands of bloggers and citizen journalists all over the world. So that's, that was my story. And okay. that's why I forced it to leave Syria, flee to Lebanon. Then I got political asylum here in the USA. Okay. Well, we're looking forward to your thoughts and we're glad you're here on the orange couch to add to our discussion. Uh, we want you to tell us what stories you want us to cover and tweet us your ideas using the hashtag AJStream. Now we're going to get stuck into this discussion in just a couple of minutes. But first, let's go to Ahmed for some of your feedback. Hundreds of thousands have filled the streets of Yemen cities since January calling for President Ali Abdullah Saleh to resign. But on Tuesday, thousands of Yemenis began an unprecedented march on foot from the country's second largest city, Taiz, to the capital, Sana'a, a distance of 250 kilometers, with the hopes of sending a bold message to the international community. Take a look at this video. Protesters taking part in what is being called the March of Life, as it's being called, are hoping to send a final message to the United Nations and the Arab League that Saleh and his aides should not receive immunity from prosecution. Now, Yemen's parliament is expected to meet on Saturday to formally pass a law that would grant Saleh immunity after a Gulf broker deal was finally signed on November 23rd in Saudi Arabia. And this map shows the path that protesters are on. They have already passed through the city of Ib, as you can see right there uh, with the marker, where thousands more joined them to continue on to the capital. Now, this video was filmed once the protesters reached the city of Ib. This is the marchers continuing on in the dark of night. They expect their journey to take five to seven days and have brought a medical team, journalists, and a movable kitchen with them. Now, as you know, at Al Jazeera, we aim to give voice to the voiceless, and we want you to be involved. Our Al Jazeera Somalia Speaks project aims to promote unheard voices from inside Somalia. 
To do this, text messages have been sent to Somalis to get their views on the conflict. Now, we received thousands of responses and are plotting them on this map. Uh, it's a Ushahidi map, but we need your help as well. If you read or write Somali, click on the Somali Speaks translation tab, enter your email, and follow the prompts. It's really a simple way for you to be part of giving voice to the voiceless. اسمي حيدر حمزوز انا من العراق انا جزء من مؤسسه موقع شوارع عراقيه انا جزء من ستريم Now in every corner of the globe netizens have taken matters into their own hands by utilizing online resources to shed light on what they view as social injustices from challenging China's ruling communist party to questioning the military leadership in Egypt to posting a satirical government press conference in Azerbaijan Bloggers have been arrested for speaking their minds. They are often held on undetermined charges and at times sentenced to years in prison without any legal process. Often governments claim that the blogs undermine the security of their respective countries. However, critics argue that bloggers are detained as an attempt to stifle dissent. Now, this video shows the De December the 15th arrest of Bahraini activist and blogger Zainab Al Khawaja. She was freed on Tuesday after much international political pressure. Well, as the list of bloggers in prison continues to grow, the debate over whether they should be viewed as journalists and afforded the same legal protection has been reignited. However, how can they be provided rights that in many countries don't even exist for journalists themselves? Have a look at this graphic here from the Committee to Protect journalists. Uh, it shows us that in 2011, 179 journalists were jailed worldwide. So this doesn't include those that are called bloggers, if you like. Iran, uh, the biggest culprit with 42, China 27, Eritrea 28. And if you visit uh, the site, go to uh, cpj.org, you can have a look at the rest of the graphic. It does give a you know, fascinating uh, cross-section of the globe and the different countries that have arrested uh, journalists in 2011. Well, joining us now by Skype is Muna Karim, a blogger with Global Voices. Also with us is Trevor Tim, an activist with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Nice to have you both with us to uh, join the discussion. Let's start with you, Muna. Uh, do you believe that bloggers are journalists and that they should be provided the same rights and, and protections that, uh, that, uh, that are afforded to many journalists? Well, I, okay, first, we should acknowledge that when we demand um, including bloggers um, under the umbrella of journalism, then we will get into another argument and debate about how professional a blogger should be and, you know, using sources. There, there will be less freedom for a blogger when, when you demand him to be uh, a journalist. That's, that's one. And another thing is that you will, in this way, exclude uh, a lot of netizens, as you cited before. Uh, netizen is a really good term used uh, lately, and there are people uh, right now, I mean, using their Twitter account or Facebook account, making a lot of impact, even reaching uh, a broader audience when compared to uh, bloggers uh, that used to um, post, especially within the last decade. So it, it's you know, like just including them will not solve the problem. What should happen, I think, is that um, th there should be organizations being formed to protect netizens in general, whether they are bloggers or Twitter users or whatever it is, because already they are being um, threatening to dictatorships. I mean, a clear, a clear example of this will be in Bahrain. I mean, I, I wrote a post uh, just recently about um, a Twitter user who, who was in prison for over a month uh, because of what he wrote on Twitter. And there are many people who uh, were arrested for so. I mean, you mentioned Zainab Khawaja, and Zainab is um, more scary for the regime because of her tweet than, than her, her blog post, okay. although she started as a blogger. Okay, let's bring Trevor Tim in here. Trevor, um, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't want to ask you the same question because I know where you stand. You believe that you know, bloggers should have have rights. I've read some of your, your works, but shouldn't we question the premise? Uh, do journalists actually have these legal protections that we say they have? There's so many journalists around the world that are, are being imprisoned on a daily basis. 
I mean, well, they absolutely should. In the U.S., um, you know, it's, it's enshrined in the First Amendment that we shall, the Congress shall make no law um, infringing the freedom of the press. Um, the problem is a lot of courts in the U.S., or not a lot, but some have have ruled that bloggers are um, in sort of a less of a class than, than regular mainstream journalists. And that really shouldn't be the case because bloggers and journalists, they serve the same function. Um, their platforms may be different, um, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, platforms have been changing for hundreds of years, obviously. When the, when the Constitution was first um, enshrined, you know, it was pamphlets that they were trying to protect in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries. And then in the 20th centuries, it was magazines and newspapers. And now it's just blog. Now it's blogs and the Internet. Um, so to say that one platform deserves less protection than another is kind of uh, misleading. And um, courts should recognize this fact. Trevor, that's, that's fair to say, but we have a lot of people uh, tweeting in about what different platforms people are using to spread or publish information. And as, as uh, Muna said, uh, in Bahrain, for example, we have a tweet from Quiet Bahraini saying, there is a crime in Bahrain called, quote, incitement to hatred of the system. We are all guilty as charged by tweeting about democracy, let alone, you know, blogging. And then we have a question from Kirsten Han that came in on the same topic. So uh, let's listen in. Hi, my name is Kirsten and I'm from Singapore and since we're discussing whether bloggers should get the same protection as journalists, there are also many people online who only use social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Would we consider them bloggers and should they also get the same protection? Not to be redundant, Mona spoke about this, but Trevor, what's your take? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there have, um, there have been countless cases in Bahrain and Syria and even in the United States of citizen journalism. Everybody has a smartphone these days and everybody can take video. And I think um, by doing so that they, they are practicing citizen journalism. And just because they aren't um, established with the moniker of uh, credentialed press doesn't mean um, that they're not serving the same function. And these, these videos um, and tweets and, and social media... Um, social media outreach um, is used by the mainstream media anyways in their reporting and it's actually um, you know kind of a cohesive relationship uh, um, that exists between the two now um, so I don't think you can um, differentiate between the two um, when it comes to laws the problem is in a lot of these countries journalists are under fire too it doesn't matter if you're a citizen or credentialed press if you're reporting in dangerous places um, you could be in a lot of trouble, yeah. and that's yeah, definitely. I, I mean, that's, that's where, where we can you know throw it to Rami and say you know Rami, journalists are under fire in a lot of these countries. For example, in Syria, many journalists don't have access to covering the situation in Syria at this moment in time. If you're you know if you're a foreigner and you want to get in, it's very difficult to get in. Um, do you feel that then that that's a far greater responsibility on the shoulders of of people like yourselves who call yourselves citizen journalists? Mm. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I would say this. Now, uh, in the Syrian revolution, we have a great example what the citizen journalist can do. So far, the uprising since 10 months is going on in Syria, and all mainstream media were banned from entering the country. But uh, there is many examples how the citizen journalists try to manage and networking between each other to create a wire for the news information, to keep the information flowing for all over the world and all the mainstream media the news agency were picking up this news after they make sure like this uh, this group or that group are credible sources mm. and they start to broadcast it so far after 10 months of the syrian uprising all the information in the news is based on citizen journalists whom they are reporting this news also uh, also ahmed i want to go back to uh, to that point, where it's, uh, it's the right of uh, blogger, journalist or not, I would say uh, I'm not here with categorizing it because we are talking about a human rights in the beginning. Mm. It's a human rights for every citizen to receive the information and spread it. Mm. So anybody, when we are defending it, it's the same case. It's the same legal right. case for journalists or for citizen. They practice their rights. Uh, Mona, I want to bring you in here because uh, all of this is you know, inextricably intertwined. You mentioned Bahrain, Ahmed mentioned Bahrain and the tweet that said that you know, just doing your job is basically treason against the state because of the way the laws are, are, are crafted. 
Here in the United States, we had the State Department saying that Julian Assange is not a journalist. Julian Assange is an anarchist. Uh, you know, Bradley Manning is, is, is an anarchist and he's, he's done the country uh, a disservice. Uh, presumably, Bashar al-Assad would say the same about Rami, saying this guy is not a journalist. This guy is an anarchist. He wants to uh, destroy the society. So there, there does, um, in a way, it does create the sense of relativism here on a country by country basis. There's no objective reality in terms of uh, who, who can be seen as authentic as a journalist. Doesn't that cook up a whole philosophical conundrum for, for people who want to get a message out throughout the world? Um, well, I, I mean, Rami said something. He said that maybe in the case of Syria, um, citizen journalism and uh, mainstream journalism complete each other. I have worked as a journalist um, in daily newspapers for five years in Kuwait, and although Kuwait is uh, comparatively with the GCC, has a better status of free speech, but we were completely controlled not only by what, by what the owners uh, of the newspapers wanted to say, but even by our like managers. So I believe in the case of the Arab world, journalism does not have any transparency. In in most cases, they they are not independent; they're not free. And those who dare break the walls will surely be brutalized and, and will be harassed and all of that. So that's why I think blogging and uh, citizen journalism is, is way more threatening. And that's why we're seeing a lot of cases where, you know, bloggers and um, citizens are getting arrested and um, they are completely forgotten. So we get to see that if we demand considering them as journalists, um, this, this won't make a big change. Not, not in the case of the Arab world. Mona, it's interesting. You use the term, you know, bloggers who uh, disobey the law will be prosecuted. We have, in the case of Syria, not just Rami, but Razan Ghazawi. As you can see on my screen, uh, she is, you know, a blogger, uh, you know, an activist. But it's interesting because this is one of the posters that was circulating online and being used to demand her release when she was arrested several weeks ago. And you notice underneath Free Razan, the label they use on the poster is Freedom Advocate. Now, one would argue that bloggers and the people who use Twitter all fall under this category. But on Twitter, LSAL92 says bloggers, as opposed to the others, are independent. They depend on themselves for everything, even protecting themselves. This is why some blog under an alias, which the, you know, Razan in Syria did not. But it brings us to an interesting question from Hamza uh, on this issue of what really distinguishes a blogger. Let's listen in. Advantages bloggers have on uh, over formal uh, journalists are their ability to locate and pass information without looking uh, for their advi advertisers and uh, corporate masters. The weakness is only uh, the ability to verify information and the lack of audience. So this came in, Trevor, from Hamza al Shargabi in Yemen. Do you agree with the way he uh, framed things? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I think you can see this in mainstream journalism as well, um, where newspapers who aren't beholden to their advertisers often do a lot better reporting. Um, in the U.S., we have the example of ProPublica, which is a nonprofit journalism organization started a couple years ago, and they've been winning Pulitzer Prizes um, for their reporting um, because a lot of times they don't pull their punches because they don't have to worry about um, advertisers paying their bills. Um, they just want a Pulitzer Prize about the reporting about um, the economic crisis. In, uh, in, the, in the UK, you have the Guardian, which is run by a trust, mm -hmm. um, and they don't, they're not beholden to advertisers either, either and they were able to um, relentlessly publish the WikiLeaks cables. They were um, able to um, uncover the phone hacking scandal in Europe. You, you see this a lot when um, these, these papers um, have to you know, get their money from other places, they may not run stories um, that they otherwise should. There's an interesting, um, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Trevor, there. There's an interesting tweet that is coming from Aisha al Mizrawi, uh, which I think um, emphasizes your point and kicks it on a bit. Uh, Aisha says, We shouldn't be protecting journalists, but journalism. And I think that's a, that's a very thoughtful point there because, um, you know, you think about it, you can, you can do celebrity gossip for an institution for a big organization and be labeled a journalist. 
but you can be, be you can be blogging about repression from some dark corner in the world, but because you don't have some sort of institution or organization behind you, you're just one of those bloggers. You're not. Oh yeah. Uh, you're not somebody who's part of this special profession. Yeah, absolutely, and that kind of brings up another point, which is the term activist that people use kind of to um, sometimes distinguish between bloggers and journalists. Um, and somehow saying that activists don't have the same rights. Um, and that's not true at all, because an activist essentially is just a journalist with a point of view. And we don't, um, in the U.S., and it should be throughout the world, we don't differentiate between um, people who report and have an opinion at the same time and people who report and try to be um, non-partial or um, non-biased. And, but the problem is, even in, um, around, throughout the world, if, if, even if non-biased journalists, quote-unquote, are, are reporting on um, government oppression and protests where the government is cracking down, um, they're going to be lab labeled activists anyways. So I think we should get away from the label of, of just activists. And, the, and citizen journalism is, is the type of, of term we should be using, because that's what it is. You know, it's interesting, Trevor, you said that journalists and bloggers, the difference is that bloggers uh, perhaps have a point of view journalists don't. I would argue maybe perhaps that many people would would contest that framing um, because after all we all have opinions um, but Amira... Oh no, I think... I think um, Go ahead. No, I, I agree with you. It's, it's in, in a lot of ways it's impossible to be completely non-biased and I don't think um, all bloggers are the same. I think they'll be painting with a lot, large brush. I'm talking more about the term activist um, because I, I think... Um, Sometimes people try to use that word to um, to kind of get away from the term blogger to differentiate between journalists and activists right. when in fact there are there is no difference. Well, on Twitter, Ahmed uh, Al Amran, who's a blogger himself but also a journalist and arguably an activist, he works for NPR but blogs at Saudi Jeans, says some bloggers are journalists, some bloggers are not journalists. There, solved. You are welcome. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because then I asked him, but what have you solved? Uh, solved, And he said, government crackdowns on bloggers happen in countries where press freedoms are not protected. Saying bloggers are journos won't change much. And also that's echoed by Amira Hanafia, who says protective laws don't mean much to oppressive regimes. Instead, focus on reforming nations, national laws, and freedom of speech. Is that the right approach, perhaps? Mona? Well, yeah, I guess what Ahmed said is um, exactly what they said in some way or another. I mean, in, in their world, press freedom is not protected at all. And let's say in the Middle East in general, I mean, in Turkey now, there are like tens of journalists um, jailed and forgotten, and some of them didn't even go to court. Um, in the case of, of Bahrain, we said that, uh, Egypt. Um, there are many cases where this happens. In Kuwait, for example, this year, marked the arrest of many Twitter users. And this never happened before. So uh, the number is crazy, I think, uh, when we compare, compare, compare it to Kuwait as a small country. Mm. And um, the, the youth were demanding, you know, instead of grilling um, the interior minister for arresting them, maybe we should pass a law that protects, um, uh, you know, online activists, or you want to call them citizen journalists, or so on. About the t using the term advocate, I mean, I also wrote something earlier this year about uh, how, how the Western media talks about Arab Spring as a phenomenon um, that was born uh, and supported by Facebook and, and Twitter. So I, I tried to explain that, okay, they helped in getting information at low um, under, you know, dictatorships. But to be honest, I think the elite of, of the Arab Spring, those who... Um, pushed for it and, and worked for 10 years for it are actually um, uh, the bloggers themselves. Okay, Mona, thanks for your thoughts. Both you and Trevor stay where you are, Rami as well, stay where you are because we're going to continue this discussion in the post show. We're going to bring up Occupy Wall Street as well and uh, uh, some of those 30 odd certified journalists that have been arrested since it began as well. So stay with us in the post show, stream.aljazeera.com. See you online.
Welcome back to the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. We've been discussing uh, whether bloggers are, are journalists. We've also been discussing whether bloggers should be given the same protections that journalists have. I think it would be fair to say that we've ascertained that merely just changing the terminology and calling bloggers journalists won't solve the problem and that if a state, um, a city or a country wants to crack down on any sort of flow of information, they'll crack down on both journalists and bloggers. Uh, so before we go into, you know, Ahmed's got some interesting Occupy Wall Street stats. Trevor, I wonder if you'd, you'd agree that while just changing the words might not change much, uh, being a blogger and an uncertified journalist, whoever is defining it, is probably uh, going to give you more of a chance of being cracked down upon, of being imprisoned, tortured, and disappearing than if you had some sort of organization as a cushion or a buffer. Yeah, I mean, I think the organization um, can provide you um, some support, um, especially when getting, if you're ever arrested and whatnot, getting the word out um, to the world, essentially, that you're being imprisoned. Um, but that's what's great about Twitter is that you can be an independent blogger these days. And if you can get a message out that you're, uh, been, you've been imprisoned or you're, um, you've been arrested, then the, the message can spread very quickly. Um, but I definitely think having the, the organization behind you obviously helps. Yep. Uh, uh, um, sorry about that. Uh, I want to bring Rami in here. Rami, looking at the different tools at people's disposal, because when we say bloggers, we're not necessarily always just referring to those who actually run a particular blog spot or a Tumblr account. So we're talking about Facebook, Twitter, blogs in Arabic and English in, in different languages. Out of all those different tools, which has been the most effective in the Syrian context? Um, absolutely. I would say, like, I will distinguish between what is the cause or what we want to do right now. For example, every tool from all the online tools has specific use. For example, I can target my own people, the Syrian people, via Facebook. Because, as you know, Facebook only puts you in touch with the people that you know. Mm -hmm. So, for the cause of organizing, networking, I will use Facebook. When I want to spread information for the whole world, I will go for Twitter. Everybody interested about the Syrian news, he will go to the hashtag Syria and uh, follow it. So every tool absolutely has specific use. We can document video in YouTube and uh, uh, share it there. Absolutely also blogs played a vital role with, uh, with what's going on in Syria to hear the, uh, the stories of people. Uh, in many times, you cannot get by one tweet interest of the whole world. There is a featured story. Bloggers managed really to publish a lot of interesting story showing the real events that are going on in Syria. So that's how it is. All these tools together is completing each other to create for us the best tools ever right. to fight for, uh, against dictatorship. Yeah. Uh, also, Imran, I want to... Uh, <clears throat> to raise one important sure. point, why it's like a journalist or a, a blogger. Journalists in somehow have immunity because there is a moral value, again, like targeting a journalist, it's a big violation against moral value. All the world, oh my God, they targeted a journalist, they arrested a journalist. So there is moral stuff behind it. But the bloggers, no, they, there is not yet, the world did not yet develop this moral issue of targeting blogger. That's why all the time when we are trying to advocate bloggers, we are saying they are playing the role of journalists. Mm. Like uh, violating their rights, it's absolutely like violating the journalist's rights. Excellent point. That's, Ex yeah. Excellent point that you make. Ahmed, closer to home, we've been talking about Syria, Bahrain, etc. Mm -hmm. you know, China, Iran, crackdown on bloggers, on journalists, arrests, um, torture. Um, closer to home, at Occupy Wall Street, we've seen journalists going in with their cameras, with their notebooks and the like, ending up behind bars. Yeah, and you're right. And in a sense, it's all related. Uh, you know, we've seen these protest movements in the Arab world, but across the world tend to expose these, uh, you know, blurred lines between what is a blogger, what is an activist, what is a journalist. And as you said, this is a Storify that's titled Tracking Journalist Arrests at Occupy Protests Around the Country by Josh Stearns. We're going to be tweeting this out, but you'll notice it says, so far, 36 journalists have been arrested in 10 cities around the United States since Occupy Wall Street began. And, uh, you know, Mayor Bloomberg in New York mentioned that, uh, or his spokesman said that only five of these journalists were credentialed uh, and had press passes. 
as some sort of a justification as to the arrests. Um, this is an image, you know, that's circulating on Twitter from Rachel Soretto saying at the bottom of this, uh, from New York, uh, presumably Zuccotti Square, saying, don't block out journalists. So Trevor, you know, going back to the tweet we had from Amira Hanafia that says, uh, focus on reforming nations, national laws, and freedom of speech in the U.S., where do you think uh, we are in terms of protecting these freedoms? Perhaps be, be, even because it was assumed that the U.S. has all of these things. Yeah, precisely. And, and yeah, how, how, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think it's a mixed bag. A lot of a lot of states have protections for bloggers. Um, as well as mainstream journalists under their shield laws, which um, allow journalists to protect their sources if they're ever called um, into uh, court to reveal them. Um, there was a case in Oregon that we just had um, a couple weeks ago where uh, a judge basically ruled that all bloggers, even um, those who work for mainstream organizations you could possibly read, um, wouldn't be protected by the shield law. Um, but he read into a law that um, essentially would have allowed um, for main, or for for bloggers of any kind to be protected, um, if you read it by the letter of the law. In New York, we have um, another problem, where uh, Mayor Bloomberg and the NYPD have been um, assaulting and arresting journalists. It seems like at a fairly regular rate. There's a there's a, a, a few videos on YouTube of, of um, photographers and cameramen trying to take pictures of um, just police officers on the public street, and they're being blocked and pushed, um, and it's a real problem. Um, I don't think that's um, consistent with um, the general laws in the U.S. Um, the, the lawyers for the major papers in the U.S. have approached the NYPD, um, and they've written a letter saying it's possibly unconstitutional behavior. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, if it continues, we'll see litigation. Yeah, but, uh, um, sorry to interrupt you again, Trevor, but I mean, the issue sure. of Crystal Co uh, Cox in, in Oregon that you mentioned, what's interesting about that is that while the judge may have ruled that she shouldn't be protected by laws that protect journalist because she's uh, not a journalist or, you know, she, he didn't see a blogger as a journalist. When you actually looked at the details of this case, you found that she did make, you know, these wildly unsubstantiated claims, you know, smearing, uh, you know, a company and a person. Um, and, and, you know, he, uh, she probably could have been sued for exaggeration and <laughs> unsubstantiated claims, which again brings us to this idea of, is there a way of both respecting bloggers on the one hand, but also trying to build in some sort of, uh, of system of reform and checks and balances into the blogosphere so that people don't end up making up stuff. Yeah, so I, the, there, that was a real problem with the case, that um, half of it was about defamation and that the plaintiff was essentially saying that she was, she was lying about him. Um, it's important to point out that she didn't have a lawyer for this, um, this case, and it's going on appeal, and now she has a lawyer. And... Um, so it's, it's unresolved in, in that sense. But the problem is that the judge didn't have to rule about the shield law. Mm. The shield law part of the ruling, which was that she could have protected her sources, was different. And the shield law said if the case was about defamation, then it wouldn't apply. Um, but instead of just ignoring that and, and ruling on the defamation, the judge went in and decided that the shield law in Oregon essentially does not protect any online journalist. Um, the law itself um, defined anybody who was engaged in a medium of communication um, that was essentially for news gathering purposes. He interpreted that to mean um, you had to be affiliated with a major news organization to be protected, mm -hmm. and that's just not the case. Yeah, uh, fair point. Uh, good looking at the different aspects uh, to this. Trevor, it's been a great pleasure having you on the program. Mona as well, Mona Karim and Trevor Tim joining Thank us you. via broadband. Rami here on the couch as well. Thanks for discussing all the myriad aspects of this. We can never resolve this in uh, 35 minutes or so, but I'm glad we at least got to delve into some of it. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you for raising up this important uh, issue. Actually. Wonderful. We, you know, we hope to have you on the couch again, but we also hope you, you know, can go back to Syria safe and sound at some sure. point. Looking forward whenever you want to. Uh, now, uh, let's uh, get some of the other stories that uh, we've been keeping an eye on in our stream leads, Ahmed. We're following three key stories in our lead section today. First, French clothing company Lacoste is under fire for banning Palestinian activist Larissa Sansur from a photography competition. Although Sansur was shortlisted for the 25,000 euro prize, Lacoste requested that her nomination be revoked, labeling it too pro-Palestinian. Her work, Nation Estate, depicts a fictional skyscraper 
housing the entire Palestinian population, as you can see right there. In our next lead, U.S. troops may have left Iraq, but they're keeping the biometric data they have on more than three million Iraqis. For more than, or for much of the war, frankly, scanners like these were used to take digital records of Iraqi citizens, but this data will not be turned over to the Iraqi government. Instead, U.S. Central Command is keeping it for future counterterrorism efforts. And for our last lead today, a lawsuit was filed early Wednesday against the U.S. Department of Homeland Security for its social network monitoring program. Earlier this year, the DHS announced it would routinely monitor public postings on Twitter and Facebook by creating fake accounts and scanning posts for key terms. The user data will be stored then for five years and shared with other government agencies. The lawsuit hopes to force DHS to disclose details of the program, and the DHS has yet to respond to our request for a statement. That's it for your stream leads today. If you want to find out more about these stories, you can visit stream.aljazeera.com forward slash leads. Vote up the stories you're interested in, and we might just feature it in a future episode. Yes, thanks, Ahmed. A reminder that uh, today, the actual topic that we did today, emerged from the stream leads section. So we really do value you going to Reddit and voting it up or uh, down. Thanks, Ahmed. Thanks, uh, Rami. Thank you all for, for watching. Great discussion. Hope you can join us again on Thursday for another show. Bye-bye for now.